a fantastic book, folks. It's one of our staff picks right now, and we're very pleased to be hand selling it. And we have the two ladies responsible for the book here with us tonight, two of our favorite writers, Pam Houston and Amy Irvine. They're going to be reading some letters to you all. And if you have any questions, you can always type those into the chat. I can call on you during the Q&A if you'd like to speak to our illustrious authors directly. And we look forward to uh, hearing these stories about the pandemic, politics, and place. Uh, both of these authors are coming to us from Colorado, the land of wildfires. We hope that you're both staying safe. I'm sure that will come into our conversation tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know, Pam Houston is the author of many books, the most recent of which is the memoir Deep Creek, another one of our book work staff picks, and the novels Cowboy, uh, Contents May Have Shifted, Shifted and Sighthound, as well as the popular collection of short stories, Cowboys Are My Weakness. She is a professor of English. She teaches at uh, UC Davis, as well as the Institute for American Indian Arts up in Santa Fe at their low res MFA program. She also teaches privately. So if you're interested in some writing courses, you can check her website out. Uh, she'll be speaking tonight with Amy Irvine. <clears throat> These two authors met as a result of this project. So this is a really cool relationship that has sprung out of writing and the pandemic. So I'm excited to hear more about this. Uh, Amy is the author of Desert Cabal most recently, also a Tory House press book. And she has a memoir out called Trespass, Living at the Edge of the Promised Land, which received an Orion Book Award. We're very pleased to have you two with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Amanda. It's great to be here. Always great to be at Bookworks. Um, I think of Bookworks. Amy and I have been going around the inner Mountain West, mostly Utah and Colorado, physically in our bodies, talking to readers and talking about um, pods of women who are changing the world. We started this tour at Hell's Backbone Grill in Boulder, Utah. You probably know it and Blake Spaulding. Um, I think of Bookworks as another one of those super female, super powerful centers of the universe. So thank you for all you do for Aww. books. Awesome. Um, we'll say this a few times tonight, but um, if you enjoy this book, please buy it from Bookworks um, rather than uh, any of the monster corporations that we won't name. Um, we, you know, I know you know this because your book works clients, but the independent bookstore is one of the last stays against fascism and we're in dangerous waters right now. So it is more important than ever in our lives to keep the independence alive. And book works is such a huge and important part of the Albuquerque community and the New Mexico community and the whole really mountains and plains district. So please do what you can to keep them uh, going through these hard times. Uh, so we started writing airmail, um, because, um, the editor at Orion magazine, uh, Sumanth Prabhakar wrote to Amy right at the start of the pandemic and asked if she would be part of a series they did called together apart where two writers would write to each other during the pandemic pandemic, right? real letters to each other to the, during the pandemic and make contact and stay in contact that way and try to break through the isolation of the pandemic. And they asked her who she would like to write with. And we had just had a little exchange on Facebook. We had never met in person. We, we share many things, um, including friends and teaching gigs, <laughs> but we have never, we had never weirdly met even though we knew each other's work and we admired each other's work. Um, so she said me because we had just had a, a, you know, a sweet little exchange on Facebook that morning. And so we started writing and we wrote the uh, asked for 3000 words worth of letters for Orion and quickly realized that we um, were really uh, counting on these letters to keep us sane and connected that we understood each other's love for the wilderness. 
we also understood something we were just talking about in a Four Corners radio interview today that that the attack on the, the, the natural world, the attack on our clean air and water, the attack on our public lands that this administration was enacting was really exactly um, the same as its attack on women and the president's actual attack on the bodies of women and the psyches of women. You know, we, we, we saw all those things so similarly, even though we had never met. And so we were forging the sisterhood and we just decided we were gonna keep writing because it was the thing, it was the space that we could get in during those early days of the pandemic, pandemic where we felt seen and heard and understood and spoken to and listened to. And so, um, so we wrote and we wrote and about 30,000 words into the project, which we didn't even think of as a project, we thought, hey, maybe this is a project. And uh, we, were, we kept revisiting themes. We were, we were building momentum. We were getting ready to jump on some Mongolian ponies and take on the bad men, you know, we were, we were fired up and, uh, and so we thought maybe this is a book and the couple of things that were important to us if we tried to sell it as a book was that it came out before the election. That was the most important thing. And that seemed impossible because we wrote the last letter on May 7th. Um, and also that it was women who were uh, behind the project. And I'll let Amy take it from there. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I echo everything Pam said about thank you to BookWorks. Thank you to all of you for showing up. Um, there's so much to distract and numb us right now. And this is one way we can all be together and keep facing into um, very uncertain times. And um, indeed, please, please buy our book, um, among other books. Get all your Christmas shopping done. Um, let's keep this bookstore going. Let's keep independent presses going, such as the one that published um, Airmail. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump right into that. It's a great segue. Um, we couldn't imagine who could possibly publish this, except for that I had had the good fortune of working with Tory House Press um, on my previous book, Desert Cabal, and knew that this intrepid group of women out of Salt Lake City, a little nonprofit press that whose mission is solely to be to produce voices for the land. Um, I knew that they would get behind something like this, and if anybody could do it, they could do it before the election. And so I called Kirsten. Uh, Alan, who is the publisher and editor, and said, so I have another project for you, but it's kind of a quick one again. It's kind of fast and furious. And she's like, no, not this year of all years. We're not doing anything crazy. Like we have a pandemic going, there's an election, like there's no money. And I said, well, there are these letters that Pam and I wrote back and forth to one another. And she said, uh, before I'd even finished that sentence, she said, yes. Um, and they've been saying yes ever since in the way that women do. Um, we dodged every publishing convention um, that's out there. We went completely off script and wrote this thing that um, was a labor of love by a group of women that just ignored every limitation that had been set in our way. And so we're really, really grateful to them for, for hustling to get behind this and get it out before the election so that we could share it with all of you. And we hope these letters are as inspiring to you and galvanizing in terms of the task that we have ahead of us. Um, we found that they were the single most important thing to both of us in this um, during this stay at home time. Um, there was so much news that was bombarding us every day and there was so much uncertainty about you know our our work being canceled or postponed we couldn't see our students because we both teach um and it was hard to know how to tell a story in the middle of a pandemic in which we knew that the world as we knew it would never be the same again that once we come out of this with everything that's happened we're very different people and we don't even have language for that yet so um, the letters provided us a way to find our way toward that. And what we found being out on book tour, yes, we have been on a physical book tour and it's been crazy and we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, we found that we needed to um, 
share this with other women and that they clearly needed it too. And we've had women buying stacks of five or 10 of these. They're just beautiful little tiny books. Um, the artwork is also done by a woman, a Utah um, artist named Claire Taylor. Um, and we just, uh, women are buying stacks of them for Christmas stockings and to give to their friends before the election and their daughters and their sisters and that's, and to the men in their lives. Um, we've had a lot of men that have really cheered us on as well. So um, I think the, the one interesting thing to say here is that we pulled it off, but in the, as soon as we had still not met when the book went to press, we had finally seen each other for the first time on Zoom when we had a production meeting with the publisher. And we were like, oh, hi, it was such a strange thing. And then shortly after that, we both had to be in Santa Fe and we met for real in person. We, and it was, a, it was still very strange, um, even though at that time, Santa Fe's numbers were very low. Um, we met outside our, uh, my daughter's and my motel room and Pam brought us green chili burgers and shakes from the Shake Foundation. And we proceeded to have this all night conversation even after my daughter went to bed um, about everything and we didn't miss a beat. And it just underscored the fact of how important letters can be, especially for women and that they're so different than texting and more quick and dirty emails. And we were definitely not just talking about the weather and how much we missed having a manicure and those kinds of things. I mean, they were really substantive. So if you're feeling lonely, we highly suggest that you take up pen palmanship again with some with another woman. It was really, really, um, really lovely. We did have one male author, a famous environmental author who heard that the letters were going to become a book. And he wrote me and said, that's really charming, this quaint little project of yours, but nobody reads letters and you two have too much in common and you clearly like each other too much for there to be any sort of dramatic tension in the letters. And I wrote back, my God, there's enough dramatic tension in the world. Like what we need in these letters is exactly what we got out of them. And that's the solidarity and the sisterhood and just the sanity um, amid so much sort of gaslighting on every level so and he didn't even realize at the time that he was sort of gaslighting us even though he was on our side um to his credit he came back and wrote a long and lovely and extremely thoughtful apology about where he may have misspoke or where he may have projected his own insecurities and all that kind of stuff and so um you know it was just it, even those exchanges that came out of our our exchanges have been really really important um, shall we read? Yes. Okay. So we're going to read, we've done a few Zoom events, so we're going to change it up tonight and read different letters. And what that means is that I will read a part of a letter that comes from just about the middle of the book. And then Amy will read part of the letter that follows that letter. And then we're going to skip to the end and read pieces of the last two letters, uh, just to give you an idea of the progression. Um, okay, so this was April 12th, 2020. Hi, Amy. I watched a woman's husband die last night in real time on Twitter. It was no one I knew. She tweeted, they took him to the hospital. They had the breathing thing attached and doing chest compressions. I can't go with him. Then she tweeted, he's too young for this. I'm supposed to go first though in her picture, she looked quite young. Then she tweeted, I can do nothing here. I can't do anything. They said, they'll call me. What can I do? I can't go to the hospital. And then I just don't know what to do. And then he's died. They couldn't bring him back. And then Leah M, a person I only know from Twitter, a person I follow because she is smart about politics, tweeted back, Lisa, we don't know each other, but I have 20 years experience as a therapist. If you want to talk, I just followed you so you can direct message me. I'll be up at least until midnight. No charge, of course, just two humans connecting. And then Leah tweeted, can you drink something with sugar in it, some tea or juice and make sure you are warm enough, put on a hoodie or a, put a fluffy blanket around your shoulders? And then 
And please remember to take deep belly breaths, inhale fully through your nose, letting your belly expand and exhaling through gently pursed lips. If your hands or other extremities start to tingle or feel numb, sit or lie down, okay? This is what tenderness looks like in the world we have made, reminding one another to breathe. Mike and I went back to that new trail this evening. This is the only time it will be viable because it is snow covered all winter and the cows own it from mid-May till September. But right now it's heaven. There are at least 20 nesting pairs of bluebirds along 100 yards of creek. It's wind protected and alive with robins and mallards and geese and some little bird that looks like a towhee but I think is too small to be one. Have to look it up. I listened hard for the rattle of a belted kingfisher and I should say we, uh, Claire Taylor also made us birds to go with our letters. So I am the belted kingfisher and Amy is the Stellar's J. <laughs> There's Amy's J. So every time we change voices, the bird appears in the book. All my life, she, the belted kingfisher, all my life, she's been my everything's going to be okay after all sighting. Uncanny in her ability to show up just when I fear all hope is lost. But there was not sight nor sound of her today along that creek full of birds, which either means all hope is not lost yet or else everything's not going to be okay. On the way home in the car, we passed the herd of Rocky Mountain Bighorn who live upriver, tons of lambs this season. They are having trouble keeping those babies alive beyond a year and there's a lot of discussion about the barely domesticated sheep the Basque shepherds run through here along the central stock driveway every summer infecting them. But the herd couldn't look healthier right now. Around the big bend in the Rio Grande, we saw about 100 elk and watched from at least a mile away as they leapt the fence one by one on their way back up the mountain. When they all got over, we proceeded, but as we passed the place where they had crossed, we saw that a yearling cow had gotten two legs twisted in the fence. We both got out and tried to pull the fence, but her legs were locked down tight, three strands wrapped around two legs and each other, the worst twist there is. So we raced to the house about 10 minutes, downriver to the bridge and then back up the other side, threw the dogs inside, grabbed the wire cutters and raced back. The whole way back going way too fast on the gravel road, I was thinking, she can't die. She can't cut her legs all the way through. We cannot be having COVID and Trump selling off the North Fork and drilling the fucking Arctic and the cyanide bombs and states needing to send local police to make sure federal government does not seize the PPE they bought from China for their frontline workers and, 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 and a dead yearling elk. And who knows if it was our fault for pulling over to watch them cross. We were far away, but still, maybe this yearling cow smelled the dogs in the car and it was enough to make her lose her concentration. What I'm trying to say is that the elk became everything. It was all 21,000 COVID victims. It was the Twitter lady's dead husband. It was the post office in the 2020 election, but most of all, it was a yearling elk cow who ought not to have to jump over barbed wire fences as tall as she is just to get a fucking drink of water one more scourge we have brought down upon the American West. And then we were back and I was bracing myself for her having in our absence cut her tendons all the way through or deep enough that she wouldn't be able to walk when we cut her down. We looked and looked and she just wasn't there. We drove up and down twice and saw no cut fence. We got out and walked and I found the place she'd been, the scuff marks her body had made when she was hanging and struggling and the fence was torqued a little, but not cut anywhere. We had not been gone 20 minutes. There are hardly any cars on the road right now. And I could see across the river to the spot where she was nearly the whole time we were driving. But we had passed one car right after we left her. And there would have been three or four minutes when the guy in that car could have set her free before we could see across the river again. Maybe he was a cowboy so fluent in barbed wire fences he knew some magic trick to get those legs out. But with Mike and I both trying, we couldn't budge it. Or maybe the elk somehow kicked out on her own, which seems even more impossible given how tight those legs were wrapped. 
My first thought when we couldn't find her was that she had been a ghost of the elk who had lost her life in my barbed wire four or five years ago at the ranch or some other spirit thing, an omen, a sign, a girl elk come to tell me Trump is about to start jailing women who speak out against him, maybe as early as next week and it's time to make for Canada and take a walk through that borderland forest. When I found the spot where she'd been, not a speck of blood anywhere, I thought it might be a sign of a different kind, that somehow this virus will change hearts and minds and the way we walk on the earth and what kind of person we wanna be president, maybe the female kind, maybe against all odds, the wild earth will escape. Maybe that teenage girl out came along this afternoon to remind me about stamina, self-care, sleep, OSHA, ginger and garlic. I ordered melatonin yesterday and my diffuser, which I would have been embarrassed to even mention in the time before this time, speaking of privilege, pumping out vapors of eucalyptus and hyssop and ravenzara. Maybe the elk was here to say, I know you think you are doomed, but if you kick just right, you can be free again. What does it mean to kick just right? To upend a plateful of Thanksgiving turkey and stuffing into a misogynist lap? to point blank ask the men in our lives if it's okay with them how Trump speaks to women reporters, how Trump speaks about all women, if they are cool with the fact that America can't find nine individuals to sit on the Supreme Court who haven't raped anybody? Or does to kick just right mean to monkey wrench, to fill the streets? Will we ever again fill the streets? Or is it time for real to start a revolution? And if we did start one, how to keep dudes like your Thanksgiving friends from railroading it and making it all about their egos? I was at a writer thing in Aspen nearly a decade ago, being taken out for expensive sushi. Confession, I will do almost anything for expensive sushi. And there was a recent Pulitzer Prize winner and, that, and another male writer fawning all over him. And after some time, the fawning man remembered I was at the table. I can't exactly remember who the fawner was, but memory suggests it was someone I know. And he said to the recent Pulitzer Prize winner, have you read Pam's new book, which at the time was contents may have shifted. And the recent Pulitzer Prize winner who by the way, no one had ever heard of until he came out of nowhere to win the Pulitzer Prize, smiled broadly and said, oh no, I don't actually read books by women. And the terrible, terrible thing I must confess to you now is that I didn't say one single thing. I just went back to eating my sushi. And that makes me hope our girl out kicked her way out of the fence somehow without the help of a burly cowboy. And it makes me think we need a plan and a good one. Happy Easter, whatever that means, Pam. April 14th, 2020. Hi there, Pam. Oh, where do I begin? You wrote just 48 hours ago and already there is much more to say. Ruby, my daughter, and I watched Tiger King, a reality TV show about a reality not based in reality, which is exactly what we are living. There are other shows that do the same thing, Duck Dynasty, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Naked and Afraid. But in this one, the dark workings of unacknowledged trauma are so apparent. The way it gets projected squarely onto women and tigers says it all. So I know exactly what you mean about that young she-elk being everything. Oh, and that younger you not saying anything to the mean Pulitzer Prize winner. The fantasy I'm having is one where we pack his nasal cavities with wasabi. Then there's a younger me who at 19 flew to New York City with my mom's then boyfriend, a seemingly good guy who had gotten me an interview with Air France for a position as, at a, as a ski resort liaison of sorts for American skiers visiting the French Alps. The job was to meet Americans in the Lyon airport and take them via chartered bus to Courchevel where I, if hired, would get them settled in their hotels and chalets, help them book ski lessons, meet them for dinner. I didn't know much French save what I'd learned in high school, but I hired a tutor, practiced my tail off for weeks. I even slept with a French conversational cassette playing all night long next to my bed. I wanted that job more than I'd ever wanted anything. And when I made it through the first interview in Park City, my hometown, this boyfriend of my mother's, my connection to the airline accompanied me to the New York offices for a second interview. 
When we arrived, we were informed that there was no hotel room, that we'd be staying in the apartment belonging to the American man who had interviewed me in Park City. First, we went out for, you guessed it, expensive sushi. I remember drinking enough sake that I challenged the sushi chef, who was a former sumo wrestler, to an arm wrestle. He won, of course. Later in the apartment that turned out to be a studio apartment, the guy gave my mom's boyfriend and me the fold-out couch, which was awkward, but there was li so little real estate it was hard to sleep anywhere else. Our host took to the floor. I woke up in the middle of the night to find him, though, on top of me, and then I was wrestling for real. But weirdly, I wrestled in silence because, get this, I didn't want to wake up my mom's boyfriend. Of course, there is no way that he slept through the whole thing, but he pretended to. On my own, I fended the guy off, but just barely. For the rest of the night, I didn't sleep for a single minute. I lay there wide-eyed, my body, body coiled like a box spring. I didn't even get that it was an attack, that my mother's boyfriend had just let me be assaulted. All I know is the next day, my head was wrapped in wet wool as I sat down in one of the fancy Air France offices with the VP of marketing. I bumbled my way through the interview. Eventually, the VP said, your French is an atrocity, but you are cute enough. You've got the job. I was so grateful. Grateful. My mom's boyfriend never said a word about the night in the apartment. And then the guy who had climbed on top of me said, you owe me. And he set out to make my winter in the Alps miserable. He even tried to get me fired, but at least I knew how to fight back in that arena, meaning I kept my job. It was one of the best winters the Alps had ever seen. I mean, fresh shoulder high powder almost every single morning for two months. It took me years to see why I failed to savor it, why I stayed holed up in my little apartment eating croissants, except when I was on duty helping American tourists. Here's the kicker though. It wasn't until last year at 53 years of age that I recalled the night in the apartment and could name it for what it was. I told my mother about it then, and her response was vague. I'm guessing it was hard for her to hear because she, like so many of us, has been caught in that kind of fence, tongue and body tangled more than once in her life. Here's another, another day. I was buying beer to enjoy on the tailgate after our hike and a big black pickup, one with a MAGA sticker, pulled up in front of the liquor store in our little town. It was a man I know, a man who I'm a little afraid of, but also like, if that isn't fucked up right out of the starting gate. So here's the newest little dirty secret, and I feel so ashamed, Pam, that even here and now, I let myself be caught in the wires again. I was beside my car, having just put the car and beer in the cooler when this guy strode over with open arms. I froze. It happened so fast, but I let him hug me. I held my breath, I barely hugged back, but I let him hug me. It was an instant, and then I jumped back and said it was nice to see him, but we shouldn't be hugging. He scowled and said it was clear that neither of us was sick. But I was sick. Sick that I froze, sick that I let him tangle with me. Not only was I that girl elk, but he was my father. He was the Air France guy. He was my ex-lovers. He was the guys at Thanksgiving. He was Trump and he was Kavanaugh. He was the hunter and I was the hunted. And in that moment, I could only play my prescribed part in that equation. I want to puke now telling you about it. My heart was pounding when I got in the car and I grabbed the wipes, the only ones we have, and I scrubbed myself so silly. Then I had Devin, who's my husband, scrub my back where the man's hands had touched my shoulders, as if I could scrub away that equation, that agreement, as if I could start over and just say no. The whole thing made me think that maybe I have no business writing a book about being like badass women warriors. I have to keep looking behind the fence to the horizon to know there is more out there, that I have every reason to keep on kicking. I was ready to give up yesterday, and just then there was good news from the Wisconsin election, the more fair-minded female judge who unseated one of the less fair incumbents, and this was despite all but five of 100 voting precincts remaining open statewide. And Bernie's endorsement of Biden. I watched their conversations and speech this morning, and while I'm so angry because Elizabeth Warren really deserved to be endorsed by those two old white guys, I am glad to know that there is authentic unity happening, that we are still capable of that. 
But before the election, we have a postal service to save, don't we? Or we'll just have to drive folks to the polls, even if we do it gloved and masked and the car windows wide open in an early winter storm. Which brings me to the hardest thing, or maybe it's all the hardest thing now. I refer to the death on Twitter to which you bore witness. Losing someone to the coronavirus is a lot like losing someone to adventure. They go up a mountain or down a river and there is an accident. You might never get to say goodbye. You might never see their body. The difference is COVID-19 patients don't die doing what they loved. So we must be careful out in the wild, in the kitchen, which is where Pam had just talked about cutting her finger. At the, time, let us, at the same time, let us hope that we continue to live in a world where we can still die doing what we love, whether it's walking in wilderness or chopping vegetables. Let's hope that the only way out is not alone in an ICU where our bodies get tricked into attacking our own lungs. Let's hope we can hold on to that kind of freedom in the high country, in the canyons, that we can watch the elk clear the fence, the horned toads scurry over stone that we can be more than hunted, that we can fuck up by staying silent, by not saying no, but then have the chance to say no the next time and be heard devotedly from within the battalion, Amy. So now I'm gonna skip to part of a letter at the very end of the book um, it, that I wrote on May Day, May Day 2020. I dreamed last night that an ex had his hands around my throat, a man who in the waking world had done the same. I couldn't speak, I couldn't breathe. I woke thinking they are gunning for a persistent chokehold. Depress our oxygen level so we aren't clear headed enough to locate the North Star when it's hanging there in the inkwell of night sky, dazzling as ever. So we can't take in air enough to walk toward it for as many miles as it takes to arrive in a healthier, kinder world. I see clearly now where to go, but I have been so lost. Every time it's because I ignored my instincts and desires and followed some guy into his narrative. There's the boyfriend I took the heat for when he rear-ended another car. And since his driver's license was suspended, begged me to switch seats before the cops got there. The boyfriend who told a teenage me to smoke something cool, which I did without question, only to learn later it was crack cocaine. There's the therapist who told me to stop writing because he thought I was like listerine, too blistering, too angry. It's inconceivable to me now that I obeyed. I own my part here, of course. But what staggers is how many men have put me in jeopardy, have used me as a rung on a ladder to get to high ground and did so without ever asking how I felt about it. I'm not even sure they noticed. After all, it's marbled into cells, psyches, society. Just as it's ingrained for women who grow up with a father who pats your 15-year-old ass and tells you that the most important class you'll take in high school is typing, not so you can write books, but so you can get a good secretarial job. Only, he adds, if you keep the weight off those thunderous ski or thighs. There are bad guys out there who will read this and say terrible things about us. There will be threats, dismissals, or worse. Certainly, there will be those who don't consider this real writing. But even a lot of good guys out there will read this and bristle, push back, and dismiss the fact that sexism is a condition of maleness, just as racism is a condition of whiteness, something we should be looking out for, apologizing for, and making amends for for the rest of our lives. Those with the wealth and entitlement inherited from forefathers who built fortunes using enslaved black people, who acquired land by killing the native people, who turned around and built the factory farms, the ski and golf resorts, the Amazon warehouses, the coal fire power plants, the hunting safaris and the gated communities. But they also founded the wilderness movement, the environmental movement. And in the process, they defended an idea of public lands romanticized and chauvinized by John Wayne, Cormac McCarthy, Edward Abbey. And until we come clean about that, until my liberal environmentalist friends stop trying to take me down at the Thanksgiving table by telling me that the story I want to write about strong women warriors is irrelevant, uninteresting, and incapable of changing the world, their hands also grip our throats. Last night, I reread Cowboys Are My Weakness. 
I confess to her halfway through the book that I actually threw it against the wall after I read it in my 20s because I didn't want to be that kind of woman and I was exactly that kind of woman. It is such a saber slicing through the story that all is well between women and men, that we are enlightened enough to meet one another in bed, in the wilderness, in the halls of Congress, in a dark alleyway, or in the driveway on equal ground. Sadly, that book is as relevant several decades later. And now I see why I first threw the book against the wall, because I envied that at that young age, you had enough of yourself to push back against the lone white male narrative. During those years, I was leading hard rock climbs, running river rescues, and guiding my squad out of wildfires that had turned on us, but I was lost in a story that wasn't my story. It would be several decades before I found my own, and when I finally told it, the backlash was swift and severe. But that's okay. It's better than living my life trapped in someone else's story, a story that requires I either die by a man or be saved by a man. No, I only want to live a life in which I find my own way before I die wizened and worn out from a life that nearly burst at the end, so full it was with opportunities to speak, ride, dance, wander, teach, learn, love. When Ruby was young, I stole away for a ski on the mountain that presides over our mesa, just the dogs and me. I meant to follow a large open draw, but a herd of mostly pregnant elk cows had bedded down in my path. I skirted them by plunging into thick timber, and while I was in the forest, the sky clouded. The wind picked up and covered my tracks, and I got totally turned around. It grew late, and there wasn't a landmark to aim for, not even the slant of the sun. The dogs paced in circles, staring at me, expectant. I wished them for a guy, my father, a spouse, a bishop, a therapist, to show me the way out. The wish was a fleeting one and a kind of flash fiction and an insane one because what else do you call it when you hand over your agency, your fate to another person? Men may not ask for directions and that is another way I have been lost with them. But this is when I looked at Pablo and Ursa, my two crazy cow dogs, and I said, go load up. They spun around and headed off in the last direction I would have chosen, but I skied after them knowing they would obey my command to head for the car and launch themselves through the open hatchback. It was a race in the twilight, but sure enough, we found the vehicle. In dreams, there are not only monsters who want to strangle you, there are dogs who listen when you speak. The psychotherapist, Jung, Carl Jung called them psychopomps, beings that if you are lost and ask for help will lead you to God. But dogs listen in the woods too, and they'll lead you to safety every time. If home proves to be a place you cannot breathe, the dogs will follow you when you leave that story. So will those velvety herds of elk cows and the forests, the elders and saplings and every tree in between. If the guns come for us, Pam, grab your pen and notebook, your bivy sack, your flint and steel, Climb above tree line on your side of the great divide, which is the only thing that should separate our nation during this pandemic. Hell, even if they don't come, head up anyway. I'll meet you there with compass, envelopes, string. We won't go alone. We'll have the dogs, we'll have mentors, students, daughters, and we'll have a few good men who are willing to walk with us, willing perhaps to play supporting characters for a while in the stories that need telling. Let's bring our ballots too. Let's fill them out and tie them to the tails of ravens passing through. Let's climb the ridge lines with the letters we've written and cast them into the clear blue sky. Then let's cast that, cast that compass into some deep icy ravine that never sees the light of day because already we know exactly where we're headed. In fierce and loving sisterhood, Amy, P.S. You have proved to be another one of my favorite animals and we have yet to meet in person. This is, <clears throat> this is from the last letter. This is May 7th, 2020. Dear Amy, your letter made me think of one of my favorite short stories, Ursula Le Guin's Sir. I wonder if you know it. The story published in 19... Sorry, yes, <laughs> the story published in 1982, set in 1909, chronicles a successful all-women expedition to the South Pole, during which, among other things, one of the explorers delivers a baby. 
The story stays with me because after the women overcome every hardship to finally reach the pole on December 22nd, 1909, and discuss leaving some kind of mark or a monument, a snow cairn, a tent pole or flag, they decide against it because there seemed no particular reason to do so because anything they were was insignificant in the face of that great landscape. As they get ready to leave the pole and head back to base camp, one woman asks, which way? And another answers, north. The narrator tells us she is glad they are leaving no marker for some man longing to be the first might come someday and find it and know then what a fool he had been and break his heart. I love this passage, not only because it explains my whole life to me in the world of wilderness guiding, in the world of publishing, but also for the humor in that one word answer. If there was an all women expedition that got to the South Pole before Amundsen's team, and this is the magic of Le Guin, the way she adds the Sur expedition to the annals of an alternate history, I bet they laughed a lot along the way. What I always used to say about my years as a river and hunting and backpacking guide was this, I never wanted to be better than the men at the outdoors. I just wanted to be good enough that they would invite me along, good enough that I could keep up. Ideally, I'd continue, they would forget I was even there. I'm not sure what to even say about this now, given all our letters have covered. Way back in graduate school, in the heyday of deconstruction, I wrote a paper on Jacques Lacan's assertion that women, by virtue of not having a dick, or phallus, as he would have said, understand far better than men the truth of non-possession. The man who taught the class told me during office hours I wasn't smart enough to write that paper, proving more or less Lacan's point. I went ahead and wrote the paper and got an A, a thing that professor was famous for not giving. The same man, after Cowboys Are My Weakness came out, told me I was glorifying an archaic form of masculinity. I noted internally only that he was an archaic form of masculinity himself. Sir is a story that is precisely about women understanding the truth of non-possession. The environmental movement in its purest and most effective form must be about the same. Your silence will not protect you, Audrey Lord says from the front of a t-shirt I have worn until it is threadbare when I am not wearing the other one with a quote from Lydia Yuknovich, I am not the story you made of me. Two days after my mother gave birth to me by cesarean, she wanted to go to a party. She was still in the hospital, but a little invasive surgery never kept my mother from a good time. She wheeled herself down to the maternity ward bulletin board and got Martha Washington's name off the list dedicated to newborn babysitting. Martha came to the hospital and watched me that night, miraculously fell in love with me and didn't really leave until she died when I was 20. Martha taught me to swim, read, ride a bike, to hold open doors for my elders. She taught me generosity is its own reward and that the failure of imagination has caused a scourge upon the earth. Most importantly, she taught me to always, always say yes to the world. This morning on the dog walk, I realized the thing I am afraid of far more than I am afraid of dying a breathless COVID death, far more than being shot in the face by a camel wearing MAGA dude, is becoming a person who says no to the world, becoming a person who doesn't go out or hike out or speak out because prudence and my survival instinct tells me I should not. That would be the bad guys winning. That would be the bad guys winning most of all. I can't say yes right now to a trek in Bhutan or teaching on a raft trip down the Dolores or a march to protect women's access to contraception but I can say yes to the tiny mountain ball cactus blooming near my clothesline. I can say yes to Lime Creek running over its banks too early, too quickly, but braiding itself elegantly and generously quenching my pasture. I can say yes to my students who I only see via Zoom these days, but who are still writing their stories like their lives depend on it, because if we don't know by now they do, we are definitely not paying attention. I can say yes to a horse named Ben, a thoroughbred paint cross, a big boy, 16'3 and broad as a boat, dark bay with a shoulder that looks like somebody threw a bucket of white paint at it. Ben needs a new home and I need something to say yes to, 
So he will arrive on the 1st of June. I can say yes to these letters, which are sustaining beyond all reason, except the reason we keep sending them across these mountains, these mountains that belong to everybody and nobody and mostly to themselves. This administration can take so many things away from us, our safety, our healthcare, our independence, our contraceptives, our freedom of movement, our livelihoods, our clean air and water, and inevitably, probably sooner than later, our right to speak. But it cannot keep us from saying yes to the world. Whether this pandemic lasts for one year or three or a decade, we will emerge knowing far better what we need to survive. Even now I can see the pencil scratching through item after item, airplane travel, hipster coffee, Wilco concert, baseball, what remains? Air, water, horses, elk cows, ravens, and dogs. I have always put my faith in the concrete nouns of the world, but realize this list will have to include abstractions, community, trust, direct action, urgency, courage, sacrifice, love. We have not one single thing to lose by believing even now that we can build the world we wanna live in and we must because time is short and inaction is death. Fighting for the earth and each other will be the only way to feel how alive we still are. So let's save the post office. Let's win the election. Let's win all the elections. Let's downshift and tap into the power I know you know we have the strength we feel when we put our feet on hard dirt or words on these pages. Let's tend to the weary, the grieving, the hungry, to all those the system is rigged against. The earth is our ally. She always has been. She understands the truth of non-possession. In fact, she wrote the book on it. Thank you for these letters, Amy. I hope there will be a thousand more. I will walk now to the back of my property where the wetland is overflowing, breathe the clean air and wait with a piece of string and this letter. Here I am now, my eyes trained on the ridgeline to the west. In everlasting sisterhood, Pam.